as you heard Nancy say, the fact that ONAP is part of the Domestic Policy Council, I think is really important. I think it's a real asset. I, again, in week six, I've been able to observe already um, how important it is that the work that's going on on HIV and AIDS and, and on implementing this strategy that we put forward um, connects to the other domestic policy work that's going on. We have the whole team that's working with HHS day in and day out on implementing the Affordable Care Act, for example. We have a, a team of experts working on disability policy, we work on civil rights policy issues, all in the Domestic Policy Council, and these things are not unrelated to each other. In fact, they're deeply interconnected with each other, and it feels to, seems to me that we, we not only strengthen our work on HIV and AIDS, but we also strengthen our work on civil rights, on health in general, on other issues, because these things are interconnected. And one of the things I've learned, I'm new to this job, and I'm not new to the White House, I've been here now. Uh, I started the day after the inauguration as the President's Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, managing his relationships with state, local, and tribal governments. What I've learned, among the many things I've learned in this place, is um, how important it is to make sure our work is really integrated, to make sure that, that we are doing a good job of um, not leaving any resource on the table and advancing our incredibly ambitious goals for this country. And so um, I've gotten to know that ONAP team. I've, I've worked very closely with James Albino. He, I kind of snuck him onto my team a little bit um, <laughs> when I'm working on Puerto Rico issues because HIV and AIDS is a pretty uh, important issue on Puerto Rico, and I had the honor of being the co-chair of the President's Task Force with respect to Puerto Rico. Um, so um, I know a fair amount about the team, um, and I know how ambitious the goals are that we're seeking to accomplish, and uh, I'm excited about it. And I'm thrilled that you're here, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Um, I am also <laughs> thrilled that you were spending today on women and girls and HIV and AIDS. Um, I'm a mother of daughters, so it is especially important to me. Um, we understand that there are unique challenges facing women and girls in this field, and um, we're going to be shining a spotlight on some of those challenges on March 14th. We're going to use that day of national observance of the issues facing women and girls um, to, to really focus on HIV and AIDS, and particularly the intersection of the spread of HIV AIDS, violence against women and girls, gender-related disparities in the United States, but also globally. It's important work. And um, I'm incredibly grateful that you're concentrating on it today. And again, I'm really sorry I missed that last panel. Um, and just since part of my purpose here is to talk to you about this work, but also to make sure that we get to know each other a little bit, um, I should say that I, I'm new to the Domestic Policy Council. I'm not new to these issues. They've never been my particular area of expertise. The, uh, before I came to the White House, I managed um, the public policy portfolio at a civil rights organization called the National Council of La Raza. I see one of my earliest colleagues, Miguel Gomez, in the back of the room there. Um, we worked together, it was more than 20 years ago. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, but when we were working together, the, the NCLR was the first national Latino organization to take on HIV and AIDS as an issue. Um, and I'm really very proud of that. We recognized very early on, this was the late, mid to late 80s, very, pretty early on in the epidemic that this was pretty important and it was something, it was important to be focusing resources and energy, um, particularly on the ways in which these issues affect people of color. Um, and I remember working on the immigration exclusion for HIV and AIDS and I remember dealing with the aftermath of that vote. Um, and I remember witnessing the uh, incredible harm that it, has, that it caused over years and years and years. And for me, there's this like little poetic sense of a circle coming together um, because this conference is coming to the United States for the first time in a really long time. Um, I understand the significance of that. Um, I played a little teeny tiny you know, bit part in that circle that's coming together um, from my vantage point as an advocate for immigrants and refugees. Um, it's, um, to me, it's a signal that while we have so much work to do, uh, and it's enormous work we still have ahead of us, it's also important to reflect on and celebrate how far we've come um, in that period of time. Um, I mean, think about it, because we invested in antiretroviral treatment People who would have died from AIDS are living full and vibrant lives. 
Uh, because we develop new tools, more and more mothers are giving birth to children who are free from this disease, who wouldn't have been even five or ten years ago. And because of a persistent focus on awareness, the global rate of new infections, deaths, is declining. Um, so it is possible to say that we are winning this fight, we intend to win this fight, but we also get this fight isn't over, not by a long shot. Not for the 1.2 million Americans who are living with HIV right now. Not for the Americans who are infected every day. This fight isn't over for them. It isn't over for their families. It isn't over for their communities. Obviously, it isn't over for anybody in this room. And it isn't over for this president. The rate of new infections may be going down elsewhere, but it is not going down in the United States. The infection rate here has been holding steady for more than a decade. You don't need me to tell you this, right? This is why you're here. There are communities in this country being devastated by this disease with new infections among young black gay men when they increase by nearly 50% in three years. This battle isn't over. We need to do more. When Latinos are dying sooner than other groups, when black women feel forgotten even though they account for most of the new cases among women, this battle isn't over. There's a lot more that we need to do. So you heard Nancy talking about how um, important it was to hear the president um, uh, speak out on World AIDS Day. Um, uh, he's committed to ending this pandemic once and for all. That is a serious commitment, and if you heard him that day, you know how serious it is. This is something that he understands. Uh, this is something that he's com committed to. Secretary of State Clinton is obviously also deeply committed to it. And we also know this is something that while this government can do a lot, we also know that we can't do it alone. And so he's also calling on other governments, healthcare professionals, service providers, and we need every pair of hands to be engaged in doing this important work. If we're going to create this, um, this uh, ambitious goal of, of getting to an AIDS-free generation, that's our work, that's the government's work, but it's the work of many, many more. And again, I'm really grateful for the work that you're doing and making sure we leave no resources on the table, no assets on the table, no pairs of hands idle in achieving this goal. So it's important that we put together this important framework for action, the strategic plan on HIV and AIDS, it's the first of its kind. Um, that's a, the blueprint that's guiding our work overall. And then the short-term plan, as I'm sure you know, is the, is the federal budget. Um, and as you know, there are important uh, investments in this next budget on HIV and AIDS. Um, investments in PEPFAR, the, um, the, which is uh, incredibly important. We're investing in proven methods to prevent HIV infection, new infections, including supporting voluntary medical male circumcision, preventing mother-to-child transmission, expanding access to condoms, providing antiretroviral treatment for six million patients. That is an enormous increase. It is a deep commitment from this administration. Um, and it fully funds the balance of the administration's historic three-year, $4 billion pledge to the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. In recognition that this is, this is a multilateral partner that plays a key role in global health, HIV and AIDS is part of that, um, and it's making progress in instituting reforms. The budget is also very focused on fighting this, uh, the epidemic in the United States. It funds cross-cutting innovative efforts for care and prevention. It authorizes HHS to transfer 1% of its domestic HIV program funding, which is about $60 million to support cross-cutting collaborations in areas like increasing linkages to care and developing effective combinations of prevention <coughs> interventions. And it expands the Ryan White HIV AIDS program by increasing care treatment by $75 million. It also, the budget is really the underpinning of our next steps on our national HIV AIDS strategy. It prioritizes <laughs> HIV and AIDS resources within high burden communities and among high risk groups including gay and bisexual men, black Americans, Latino Americans, substance users, and it expands in investments in preventive care and research. So we have a lot ahead of us. We know there's a lot more work to be done. We are currently looking deeply at the intersection of the Ryan White program and the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. And again, this is why it's a really good thing to have ONAP and the team working on the Affordable Care Act as part of the same team.